joining us today. Um, you know, the, the subject we're going to be discussing is cost and price proposal development. Uh, just a little bit about my background. Um, I've been doing cost and pricing wow, for over 30 years. Uh, I started out in my uh, early career doing contract administration for uh, an 8A company that I kind of grew up in. And one of my functions as contract administrator was to support the business development department by doing cost proposals. Um, so I got my feet wet and, you know, we started winning proposals. You know, I got further and further into that and I took some classes that, you know, related to cost and pricing, which helped me excel. And today I support several several companies uh, throughout the Maryland and, uh, well, in, you know, the Maryland and Virginia area, Washington, D.C., and providing cost proposal support as needed. And I've been working with the PTAC now since 2012, I believe, um, teaching cost and pricing, as well as some other classes you will see, uh, like uh, technical proposal development and um, contract administration. So, as Jasmine mentioned earlier, you know, we're going to open the floor for questions at the end. And um, may pause between certain sections and just to ensure if anyone has any questions from the uh, sections that we cover as we go along. Um, let's get started. Okay. So I'm assuming that everyone here has been involved with doing the technical proposal section or have some knowledge of uh, the request for proposals from the federal government or state and local governments and that you're kind of familiar with where to go in the RFP to find out what the pricing instructions are and stuff like that. But I just want to kind of summarize it just in case. Um, when you get us an RFP, what solicitation and you decide to provide a, a proposal um even if you are doing the cost and and the pricing for that bid you need to read the solicitation thoroughly okay and i teach that in my cost proposal class as well um you need to know exactly what the government's asking for okay and that's the only way you're going to do it i also encourage the persons doing the cost and pricing to actually sit in on any technical proposal meetings so that you are also aware of what's being uh, considered in the technical proposal as a solution so that you can be aware and cover those costs or cover costs that people are posing in the technical solution. Okay. But first of all, you know, you know, I wanted to start with that so that you can kind of get the picture of where we are with pricing for people who may not be as experienced as others in this, you know, listening to this presentation. Okay, let's first start off with definitions, and then we're going to go into what is considered the basis of costs. Okay. Pricing definitions, types of pricing proposals. This is also the same for types of contracts that the government will issue you after you've won an award, okay? So one type is a fixed price contract, okay? This type of contract is based on a price that you would develop that will be a lump sum for each option year of that contract, and it's usually divided into monthly increments that you would build from, okay? Um, we're going to go into each 
one of these types as the presentation, but I just want to kind of give an introduction now. There's a firm fixed price. Okay. Now, firm fixed price is a fixed cost that you would be billing the government on a monthly basis. There's also a cost plus fixed fee. All right. Now, cost plus fixed fee types are the best position that a contractor could be in, in my opinion, because the risk is on the government because uh, in this type of contract, the government reimburse you for all costs that are uh, in, you know, accumulated during that uh, performance of that bid and not bid, but the contract. And you can charge it back to the to the government, and they will reimburse you. But it's based on a fixed fee. Okay, so you would reimburse for your costs plus the fixed fee that you agree on with the government. Okay, the fourth kind is a cost plus award fee. Okay, um, it's the same as the cost plus fixed fee, but the the fixed fee is based on performance, okay? So you uh, would present two fees. One would be a, a set fee that you would get with your normally um, submitted invoices. And then award fee, the other fee would be the fee that you would be awarded for performance. So this kind of motivates the contractors to do a better job uh, to get the complete fee. You know, so like say if you were, if you were bidding 10% fee, you would bid five, and then you get the other five in increments based on the performance of the contract. Let's talk a little further about that. The main characteristics of the FFP, firm fixed price contract are. Okay, the contract and the government agree to a firm fixed price, which cannot be adjusted due to the cost involved. Experiment, experience, excuse me. Now this means when it's a firm fixed price, the risk is on you, the contractor. So when you're doing your pricing, you have to be very, very careful and cover all the costs involved because the government will not change the pricing because you omitted a particular cost in your pricing okay so you could either you know you could lose you could win the contract because you had the lowest price firm fixed price and then you start performing and you realize oh my goodness you know i forgot to uh include Travel. I forgot to include uh, paper clips. Okay, but it depends on the services you're providing and and how that particular item would affect the performance of the contract. You could go in default, or you could, you could lose money because you did not think through all of the elements that you needed to uh, charge under that particular contract. Okay, so that's why we say the contractor bears all the risk. The contractor is required to deliver the end product that you're providing in that, under that contract and it's referred to as the deliverables, even if it costs more than the amount of the contract to do so. All right, so that I'm saying this to say and emphasize, it's very important that you and your company think through exactly what the exact cost is gonna be to perform that work because you, you really could set yourself up to fail if you don't do it correctly and you build wrong. Okay. The main characteristics of the cost plus fixed fee. This is where the government reimburses the contractor for allowable incurred costs plus a fee. As the government bears the cost risk, the contractor is required to make satisfactory progress and usually must deliver the end products described in the contract to earn the fee. 
Legally, the contractor can put his pencil down when all costs agreed upon in the contract have been incurred and reimbursed. Okay. These type contracts are the types that usually get audited most often by the government. And when you're performing these contracts, you're usually uh, visited by the Defense Contract Audit Agency, DCAA. And you know they want to make sure that the price, the, the elements of your cost proposal and charges that you charge the government were in fact true and correct. So you need to make sure that your accounting system and your uh, books are um, telling the same story so that when the audit occurs, you can justify any questions the government may have. And at the end, they will you know, either say, okay, maybe you, you, you overcharged or something, or we didn't get a receipt for something. And it could be that you have to give them something back if, if it turns out that the audit reveals something like that. But generally, if they, you know, do their final uh, review and you, you will be just ensure that you got paid all the expenses that occurred during the performance of that contract. So, um, most of the time I've noticed cost plus fixed fees are usually, you know, in the DOD realm or uh, for services that are kind of open ended, like software development or um, it's where you don't really have like a, a, a definitive deliverable to give. You have a deliverable, but it, it, there, there are things that could go or happen during the performance of that contract that could extend the performance because of things that are outside of the contract that's controlled. Like a software development project. Those of you who may be in IT kind of understand that when you're developing your software and you're doing it for somebody and you know they they get a review and they decide to make changes, you know. So that will make the cost change back and forth. You know, as you go through different iterations of that, of developing that software. So that's why this type of contract kind of works very good for that particular area. Um, as I said, you will be reimbursed for all costs incurred. So that's the best world to be in, I think. Um, generally, I do not see cost plus contracts on uh, state and local levels. Um, mainly in the federal government, and you know, like I said, I you know most of the time I see it recently in the last past few years under the DOD realm, and um, and it could occur in other agencies who may have uh, projects like software development or um, could be manufacturing or something like that. Okay. While a pre-award survey may be performed, there is a more oversight over the end of a cost plus fixed fee contract, like I just mentioned about the audits. An incurred cost audit is required before the remaining cost and fee are paid. The contractor is paid an approved invoice, and you may see them being called vouchers, is submitted to the government. A cost plus six fee contract is definitely more complex to administer and requires compliance with more cost regulations. Um, I have managed several uh, cost plus contracts in my career, and and I can truly testify that yes, it is. It could be a nightmare to to administer because um, even the invoices every month is a job. And, and many times contractors have to hire a specific contract administrator to assist accounting in developing the invoicing on a monthly basis. Because you can think about it, you're charging every expense that comes up. Then, you know, it could be travel involved. It could be um, expenses or, or new materials or, or whatever you order during that monthly period, you know, you would need to present receipts with each invoice and submit it all for review and payment by the government. So 
just even keeping track of all the expenses is um, a tedious job. And um, but again, the reward is you get reimbursed for reimbursed for all the expenses. Versus the flip side, when you do a firm fixed price, if you know you project the cost for certain supplies that you're providing the government for a particular product or service, and if they, those prices change during that year, then and you are still obligated to to provide those supplies under that contract, then you're going to have to pay the cost for that. So. You can see there what the risk is between the two types of contracts. Okay. So I'm just uh, urging you to do your due diligence when you're developing your pricing. If you think through it well, just like they do for the technical proposal, same thing, and that you actually even review it at the end and, and um, bring the powers to be together to discuss, you know, your comp competitiveness of your pricing. You know, and a lot of people worry about, again, what the competitors are going to be and, you know, how they're going to win, you know, but, you know, if you're going to be in business, you want to make sure you're making a profit and not going and hold. So you need to take the time to really concentrate on um, making sure that all your costs are, are covered under each bid that you make. And then later on, if, you know, you decide I want to take a risk and uh, decrease certain of uh, costs under my contract, then that's on you to do that. But hopefully you're at a, a level in your company where those costs that you may have decreased can be covered by the profits from other contracts you already have. You know, so that's as you grow. But as a new company, I urge you to please, you know, bid and make sure that you're getting all of your costs covered under each bid. That being said, we're going to go into what the basis of cost is. Okay, This is exactly the elements that you have to build on to build your cost proposals and determine what the bill rates will be for all of the various uh, labor categories under your cost proposal. Okay. So just a quick review. We're going to be covering direct labor, indirect rates, branch benefits, overhead, general, general and administrative fees, which we call DNA, and profit or fee. So let's start with direct labor costs. Direct labor is the cost of the personnel that you provide to support the contract you're being in. Okay. So that's the first element. So this is where you start the costing. So you need to be able to decide. Who are you going to propose? And that's if the government doesn't tell you. Now, a lot of times you get RFPs and solicitations when the government tells you exactly which labor category is to bid. Um, and normally that's either on a time and materials type contract or, you know, um, but if you're doing a firm fixed price, normally you, the contractor, decide what labor categories would best fit to provide that service or product. So you're going to go out and do what we call a, a market survey, you know, to uh, be able to uh, ascertain what people in those labor camps are getting currently paid in the market. And or you might look at if you're an experienced company, what people in your organization working in those same labor camps are currently being paid. Okay. So because you will have to justify where these labor category salaries have come from and most cost proposals, okay? So, but it's, at any rate, it's still good for you to know because this is the basis of your bid, all right? 
This is the most important element and frequently the largest dollar amount in the first part of your proposal process. You should make careful estimates and it must be made of the number of hours the key personnel and other employees will, will work during the performance of that contract, okay? So you're gonna be looking at what they're gonna pay and how many hours they're gonna be working on that contract per year, okay? And then you take that amount and that'll give you your total direct labor costs, okay? So these, the hours worked are multiplied by the specific hourly rate and it results a total, which gives you the total direct labor costs. Here we're talking about proposed staffing and direct labor rates, okay? You need to, do, again, like I mentioned earlier, de determine what your staffing levels are. And in a lot of organizations, you know, the um, pricing person doesn't come up with staffing, you know, un unless the RFP provides them. But if it's a firm fixed price and you're uh, developing your staffing yourself, the labor categories, are determined by the, the technical experts in your firm who are most familiar with that area or managing contracts similar to what you're bidding. And they come up with the best solution for the solicitation um, request and what positions would best be utilized for uh, performing the work. So they will be determining the staffing levels as well. You know, um, in this particular bid, you may need you know, five programmers or six admin assistants. And, you know, you should also take into consideration geographic area that you are uh, working in. What are they play, paying people in the area where the work is going to be performed? Okay. Um, so you're going to be determining what that is for each labor category and how many positions you need under each labor category. So you're gonna be also analyzing your current staff direct labor. Again, like I mentioned, you may use that to kind of get a gauge on what you're currently paying people who work in similar positions. And third, last but not least, you may want to look at uh, if you, let's say this is a new requirement that's similar, to, you know, in your past performance and you're bidding it, but you haven't really had individuals working under that area. So you kind of look at what the salary data is currently for these individuals. So you would seek out salary survey data, okay? And um, we're going to talk a little later about you know where you can look to find that, but. Um, there are several surveys that you could uh, kind of look. Some of them cost money, uh, depending on the size of your company. You might um, want to purchase that. Uh, one good source that I've been using recently for some of my clients have been uh, just kind of searching uh, Indeed, uh, which is um, People go to Indeed to look for jobs regularly and the companies, different companies post their job requirements out there and the salary requirements. And this helps Indeed come up with um, sort of like a salary calculator that you can kind of check and see exactly what people in the area are paying for specific jobs. So, you know, that's one source, and, you know, there are, um, a variety of other ones that you could use as well. Were there questions, Jasmine, right now, Jasmine? Yes, we do have a couple. Okay. This one's from Philip. He asks, the majority of contracts that I am seeing are lowest price technically acceptable. Is this typical? He's in the satellite communication industry. What was the first type he was saying? He says the majority of contracts he sees are LPTA, lowest price, technically acceptable. And he wants to know, is this typical? <laughs> Well, again, it depends on the, the, the agency and the area you're in. Um, now, you said satellites. 
development or um it says satellite communication communications okay gotcha gotcha okay i mean it depends on the agency that and not pretty much the area really that people put those lptas out and um i don't know i mean they put a lot of them out like i said in the federal government it, it varies from agency to agency it depends on the state of funding usually you know um and what the requirement is, because a lot of times it's an indicator that, you know, wow, they're looking to get the incumbent back because it's kind of hard sometimes to estimate what the incumbent's doing and um, how to unseat them with the lowest price if you don't really know the ins and outs of what the current contract is doing. Um, but, and it's risk, a big, big risk for contractors to bid on those types because again, you will go low just to get the contract and end up not uh, being able to perform well. And a lot of those LPTAs are usually like firm fixed price types. Okay. Again, that puts you in a bind. Um, so I would just say be cautious when you do that. Um, if you have as much intelligence about the bid to be able to, to um, you know, uh, determine that you can indeed be successful bidding the lowest price. What you should do is be at the lowest price that's best for your company, okay? Because if you go in and, you know, trying to undercut even the incumbent, let's say you did find out what the total contract value was. Again, you don't know the difference. You may not know, some people may, but if you may not know the difference between your original contract and what you're bidding on now. And so that way, you know, when you're you're estimating what that lowest price is that you're trying to beat, that's difficult. And and if it's a new requirement, then that really puts you at a disadvantage. Okay. But you know, of course, in each LPTA, you have to meet the technical requirements first. Okay. Um well, actually, the normal way they do it is they look at the lowest price, then they determine you're technical, technically competent. That's what it is. And then if it turns out that you're not, they go to the next lowest price. Okay. But, um, you know, I would just caution that when you do decide to bid on LPTAs, just to be careful. Did I answer this question correctly? Did I need a, a follow up to that, or did I miss something? Um, okay, Phil, if, you, if, if, if that's okay. Yes, he says yes. <laughs> right, okay, right. so we have a question from Martin. He says, um, how are firm fixed priced versus cost and materials pricing different? And can we calculate cost and materials based on firm fixed price? Yes, you can. But like I said, on a firm fixed price, you have to be sure that you encompass what the true cost would be for you to provide those uh, products or services or anything, any element of that you're providing, supplies, whatever, that you are incorporating that true cost in your in your pricing for a firm fixed price, because you're not going to be able to adjust it, and that you also have some kind of escalation to cover the increase in cost over the option year periods that it may be awarded under any contract okay or inflation okay and you know it's okay as long as you document what you're doing to the government to do that escalation because you don't want to do one flat price for supplies and then it turns out the next year those prices double in, in cost and then oh my goodness you, you're gonna enter it you know and you can't go back to the government and ask to um, make a change. Only the government could change the scope of the contract, okay? So, you know, just keep that in mind. You know, I have a, a story I tell about a, a, a bid I did for Aberdeen Pool Rounds with the company, and um, they were building army trucks. And when I say building army trucks, meaning they had to provide all the parts that it takes to build a truck. Um, they were a uh, well-respected company and uh, they had done work with Aberdeen before and they felt really good about the chances of winning. 
but they didn't think through their pricing or double check it. I'll put it, I'll put it this way. They didn't double check like they should have. And they forgot to build a type of screw that was really needed on that to build the truck. That wasn't discovered until after the contract was awarded to them. And they started performing. Well, it was a big problem because, you know, they did, you know, hundreds of trucks, you know, it was a pretty sizable contract. And so the number of screws they would have had to purchase, you know, was a big part of uh, the cost that they should have included in their proposal. And it wasn't. So in order to save face and be able to, to perform well, they had to go out and get an extra line of credit to cover the cost for that one screw that they forgot to order for the many trucks they had to deliver to uh, the government. So that's how things can happen. That's why I say, you know, just like you review your technical proposal, your cost elements and what's included in it need to be verified according to whatever product or service you're providing. Okay. Okay. Well, I will take another question before we move on. Um, mm -hmm. This one is from Philip. He says he understands an advantage percentage for small businesses and veteran-owned businesses. What is the exact percentages? Also, if a solicitation is not offered as a set aside and one of these disadvantaged businesses win, will the next solicitation automatically be for that set aside? <laughs> A bit of a mouthful, but do you want me to repeat it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, breaking in parts there, the first part first. Okay, so he says he knows that there's an advantage percentage for small businesses and veteran-owned businesses and um, SDVOSB versus large, right? Do you know what the exact percentages are? No, to my knowledge, that could vary from bid to bid, but that's something you need to justify or, or find out prior to bidding usually it's in a solicitation document when it's a, uh what it um i mean are you talking about across the board on 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 all things uh to my knowledge it could vary based on the bid like if it's something that's let out of the va or if not other agencies kind of buy into uh and um indefinite delivery indefinite quantity type contract with certain agencies so let's say if um, the VA had um, a contract task order that came out from NOAA, they would set their parameters about, you know, what the percentage of participation would be. You know, just like all business set-asides, I think you need to look at each uh, site and determine what those percentages are um, that of points that you would obtain for, because you are a veteran, okay? Um, so it varies from set aside to set aside and, you know, just make sure that, you know, if you don't see it in the RFP that you do present the question to the government before bidding so you know exactly how to utilize, best utilize your certifications to set aside. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's, uh, we can proceed now. Great. Great. All right, so uh, I talked a little bit about a salary survey data. Um, so we can go on. All right, determining salary requirements. Okay, this is called a summary of what I mentioned earlier before we ask questions. Um, staffing requirements can be provided by the RFP or the solicitation document. If it's not provided by the RFP, you can look at the position description and the statement of work and analyze the type of work to be the part uh, to be performed and what workload they'd be supporting and look at what the rates are going to be in the general market okay so you can come up with your positions and the number of positions you'll need for each like i say i'd best suggest that you use the experts in those areas of the various areas that you're uh, bidding on to make sure that you know you get a good handle on exactly what it takes to perform that work. You can review your current staff direct labor rates, determine if you have similar positions in the company for work comparable to the RFP requirements. 
Keep in mind geographic location of performance of work. And then I'll, in, you know, an example of that is like if you're here in the, the Washington, D.C. area, then you could look up salaries in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and if you're performing work here in the D.C. area and you have employees with, that work in the same plan categories, the actual rate of pay would be different for those same positions that they were performing work, let's say, uh, out west in California, okay? So it behooves you to kind of do your research and um, ascertain the right salaries for the geographic areas you're going to be hiring people to perform in, okay? The salary survey data, uh, like I mentioned, indeed, that um, I've been recently using to get salary data. Um, Career Builder is another website you might want to um, look at. Actually, a lot the government utilizes Career Builder in um, their hiring um, when government people move around. So it gives you a good indicator. Uh, you could also look at the, the uh, GSA scale rates so of what people in the government are making and compare them to the private sector and see which um, what the best salary solutions are for your particular price point. Um, other survey options, um, there is one that's approved by Defense Contract Audit Agency, DCAA, is called Economic Research, Inc., E-R-I. Um, this one is um, a little pricey. But if you're at a position, your company's in a position to afford it, then that's something that will be very beneficial because you can actually predict what that salary would be for any position you're you're bidding on contracts that could, you know, be six months from now. Because in that particular uh, system, you would input the start date of the contract and the salary that they give you in the software will predict exactly what that rate would be for that contract date, start date. And uh, like I said, at any rate, whatever source you use for the salaries you provide for your direct labor, you need, you, we have to justify to the government. So make sure you keep good notes, your paper trail, and then your cost volume where you defend your cost proposal you need to actually document those things to the government so that they have a full understanding of how your cost is being built. Close labor hours. Sometimes the number of hours per position is provided by the RFP, some cases not. So again, you know, you're gonna have to uh, decide what those numbers are. Um, each company can develop their own what we call productive work year based on the number of days they give their full-time employees days off during the performance years. Um, for instance, different companies have different benefit packages, for instance, where they might give uh, vacation time and uh, sick leave. Then you might have others who only uh, give their employees what they call uh, PTO, paid time off. So those paid time off totals will be will vary depending on you know from company to company. Now, it depends on how you're organizing and um, what you're giving your employees. So the labor hours per year that your employees will work will be based on exactly how you are giving them lead time. Now, unless the government says this is um, a time of material and they tell you we want you, this position to work 2,000 hours a year, then you have to give the government what they're asking for. But if it's a firm fixed price and then they give you, they never gave you the amount of hours needed to work, then you need to make sure that you know, you're know you providing um, the total, the correct total of hours that your company productively will be providing people to work, okay? Because you know you have to take out the holidays, the government holidays that you're going to be uh, letting people utilize. So um, 
we'll talk about this a little bit later, you know, the total number of hours a person in the whole year is 2080, 2080. And then you take out your uh, lead totals for everything, and then you will come up with what we call the productive work hours. Any questions there? No. Um, yes, yeah, somebody was asking a question. Walter was asking a question about the resource that you mentioned. Could you repeat it? Is it eriri.com? Um, is it for the salary survey data? The ERI? Economic yes. Research? In yes, that's it. Yes. You can Google them on, go and Google them and then they'll come up directly. Um, like I said, they're approved by DCAA. So when you um, use them and you document that in your proposal that, that tells the government, oh, okay, they have one of the top-notch salary survey programs. Okay, I've even seen some small businesses pool together and get it. And you know, so like normally you buy like login, so you know you can utilize it, you know, in cooperation with each other, not at the same time go in and do it just to cut costs and be able to have access to a system like that. But like I say, there are other ways of, of determining what the salaries are, but you should justify it whenever you know you use salary survey data or however you come up with your labor caps. Okay, so I'm just confirming, Arlene, that it's the Economic Research Institute, correct? Yes, yes. Yes, yes okay, so that's it. Um, and Martin asks, just to confirm, using 2080 hours as a guide for our proposals is not enough as we have had to add the time off hours described in the RFP. Is this correct? No, no, what I meant by 2080, that's the total hours that a person could, if they worked 365 days a year, eight hours a day, it would be 2080 hours, okay? That's for you to consider when you're you're coming up with your own hours for the labor categories, okay? So that's the total number of hours in a year, and then you would take out the number of hours that the people, your your people in your organization take off for sick leave or PTO or whatever to come up with your own productive work hours. Now, the other the opposite end of that is that. Some solicitations, the government will tell you how many hours each labor category must work. So in that case, you provide what the government asks you for. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That's all the questions for now. Good. Okay, let's go into we, we talked about how to come up with our direct labor. Now we're going to get into indirect rate development. Okay, and kind of summed around them in the beginning of this section. And the next element is fringe benefits. Okay, fringe benefits are the things that you provide your employees so that you can hire and retain them. Okay, and make it attractive to work at your company. Fringe benefits would be uh, vacation time. Six, sick leave, your insurance or health coverage. Um, it can be um, the taxes that you pay, payroll taxes, stuff like that, FICA, FUDA, indirect rates and the, under the fringe benefits. Okay, and we're going to be going through them all. Okay, examples of fringe Costs. Now, this is a, a, just an example, but what it may look like for your company is specific to your company. You may want to look at your uh, uh, check with your accounting department on your chart of accounts and see how they're segregating costs and look at what they have listed as fringes, okay? And like I say, whoever's doing your call should work closely with accounting and making sure that the, the numbers that you're getting are true and correct, okay? So we're looking at how many, uh, what your, your vacation and sick leave packages are, holiday leave, um, 
Will your company be providing any administrative leave or bereavement leave, military reserve leave, jury duty leave, FICA, as I mentioned, federal unemployment, state unemployment, group medical insurance? Some companies even provide, in addition to um, the group medical care, disability insurance. And let's make it more relevant to what, what we have today. For instance, we have the Affordable Health Plan. Um, some companies, because they may not have grown to the uh, extent where they are uh, providing a group health package for their employees, they are paying their employees to buy their own health insurance coverage from the Affordable Health Plan. So that cost would go there, okay? So in lieu of a group medical insurance cost, then that would, that was what you would cost out um the cost let's say if you gave them a thousand dollars a year or, or x no or whatever number you do you decide to get provide to them you account for it under your fringe benefit cost um you could also be offering life insurance um every company is required to have workers compensation and so you take that cost and spread it among your uh, proposed positions you should also include things like uh, tuition reimbursement or training programs that you're gonna be um, providing to your employees working on that contract and what that cost is gonna be and the frequency of that training and what that total cost is gonna be. And then, you know, there may be other benefits that pertaining to the type of company you have that you are providing, okay? So once you get that total, you're gonna to be uh, looking at the total cost. And so you will take the total fringe cost and divide it by the total labor cost. This will give your fringe percentage, okay? All right, so you're gonna have a percentage for fringe. So now we're gonna go into over here. And let me just clarify, we break out fringe from overhead, but some companies pull it all together as all overhead. So some companies may do their pricing and their overhead includes the fringes, okay? The way I teach it is I like to have it separated so I can just give you a distinction, okay? Um, the benefits and all of that, the reason we show fringe is separate, which this is exactly what you're giving to directly to the employee, like directly affecting that employee. Now, so is the the um, overhead cost, but it's more like a more a little bit indirect, not directly hitting your pocket, but it's cost that you're spending on the employees, but it's not going in their paycheck necessarily. Okay, so let's talk about those items. For instance, these are other examples of overhead costs, okay? And that would be, let's say if you decided, you know, um, I don't, this particular contract doesn't have a program manager, but you have a corporate co program manager who uh, spends time visiting that site and making sure that things are happening and, and the deliverables are being met and stuff like that. So part of their time, let's say they might come to the contract site eight hours a week or two hours a week, whatever. You would take an account for that time that that particular um, manager would be spending at that site and you would include that in your overhead, okay? So we would call it labor for the program management. And then marketing expense. If you already have a contract that you're running or, and, uh, you know, uh, normally once you win a contract with a certain agency, logically, most companies continue marketing to that particular agency, right? To grow their uh, exposure to that, that organization and uh, to get more contracts. So part of the marketing expense that you're going to um, expend for that growing that contract can also be added into your overhead costs. Again, um, 
any additional training that you might uh, provide for people on that contract will be under the overhead. If you have to go out and get equipment or get a facility and furniture, overhead, okay? And so that's the complete amount, especially if it's something that you're providing for a specific uh, facility that you're obtaining specifically for that contract, then all of those costs will be under overhead. Let's say if you had an office at your home corporate office that you were housing people who were working at your facility supporting a government contract, then you would segregate those costs and estimate how much of the um, equipment you will be providing for that individual to do their work at your facility, okay? Office and computer supplies, same thing. Software and maintenance agreements. Now, you know, when I enlisted program manager, you know, his calls for computers and what he's, the computers that you buy for him can be split in under the overhead for that contract and the remainder will go on the GNA, for instance. And we'll talk about GNA later. But it's just the way you consider all costs that impact this contract directly. Okay. Postage and delivery. Overhead. Travel. This could be travel. It's not travel that the government would ask you to do because normally when the government asks you to do, uh, travel, they reimburse you, or that's a cost element under your contract. I'm talking about, let's say you're in Washington, D.C., and your contract's in Colorado, and the, the program manager I just mentioned has to travel to Colorado to make sure things are going well and meeting with the government out there, right? Well, those costs fall under overhead. The cost for his travel or her travel would be included. Um, and any other individuals who might have to travel in support of that contract that are not a direct bill to the contract would be in the this overhead expenses, okay? Um, there may be uh, particular publications or subscriptions that you have to buy uh, for your employees to stay abreast of the technology they're using or support their service area and you uh, invest in those things, then you can um, put part of the cost at least under that, that chargeable to that contract. So when you say dues and publication, that could go in that element. Um, depreciation and amortization, that's if you buy pro property uh, that you um, buy for the government, then you have to like uh, put down as you perform the work, you know, any um, depreciation for any equipment or, you know, or property that you may have purchased on behalf of the government. Um, again, business insurance, because you need it to cover all of your contract personnel. Those policy costs can be uh, charged in over here. Any taxes and or licenses that you have to obtain specifically for that contract, or if it's a a license that you um, purchase to do business for the type of business you have across the board, then you can prorate it per contract, okay? Um, severance pay. Now, normally, you know, let's say if you have to downsize and uh, lay people off, a lot of companies include costs for severance under their overhead, okay? So that they can cover that if they have to lay off people. And it's not any fault of that employee at all. Uh, if the company decides to do away with that element and you have to lay the person off, then, you know, in good faith, you are able to have enough coverage in your overhead costs to cover paying them an extra week or two, you know, for being let off abruptly, okay? Um, you can have another miscellaneous section under here to cover unknown costs um, or add additional items that depending on the 
area that you're working under that may affect your contract, you need to include that and think it through, okay? So then you would total all of these expenses. And this is our cost buildup now. We're building the cost, the bill rate for each labor cat. So you'll take the total French pool plus the labor base and divided by the overhead base amount, which is the total expenses for overhead. This is going to give you the overhead percentage. Okay. So what I'm giving you is the exact formulas that you would use to bill your costs to come up with your direct labor rate, your bill rates for each labor category. So this is something you can take, you know, and use in your cost proposal development. The next cost element is general and administrative costs. So let's talk about what cost elements are fall under that category. Okay. GNA, as you said, yeah. GNA is the cost that is incurred by the, let's say, corporate office that supports the whole company. Okay. When you win a government contract, that contract becomes part of the umbrella of the whole company. So the people who are running the home office, they have duties that help make that contract successful. Okay, so even if you have a receptionist at the front desk answering the phones, um, an accountant who's working on payroll and accounting um, that's going to be uh, doing payroll for that for the whole company, including all the, all the contract people, part of their costs is put under DNA. All right. Again, you're going to have depreciation based on. The individuals who you deem are the DNA positions, the positions that are supporting that contract at the corporate office. A portion of their fringe benefit costs can be charged to that contract because they are charging, they are spending time working under that contract. Okay. So you can include it there. And in some cases, like I mentioned, I started out as a contract administrator. I administered all the contracts for the organization. So my, my costs were spread out in the GNA rates of all the contracts that, that the company bid on. Okay. Right. So that's how it's done. And, you know, of course, when you get your first one, I'm only administering one. So, you know, in, in, in reality, you can say, well, I'll charge her whole salary. That's the only one she's working on, you know. But you have to also look at, you know, what other duties I might have in the organization that would uh, decrease that amount. So you want to be realistic as possible. So you kind of look at actual time spent supporting that contract you're bidding on, or what you're projecting it will be once you win. Okay. Again, uh, interest, any office surprise that you would be uh, providing for your admin staff that affects the contract performance. Um, part of the corporate office rent because these individuals are sitting in an office that you're paying rent on on a daily basis. Now, in today's COVID world, people are working at home mostly, but you know, everybody's praying that this is a temporary thing and you know, hopefully everybody will go back to normal or this may be our new normal. So you're gonna have to rethink some of these elements should that happen. But at any rate, you could be providing um, your employees with laptops to work on and stuff like that while they're at home, um, working from home during this period. So again, those calls can be spread out. Now I'm talking about future bids that happen while we're in a situation, right? Because you're forecasting what's going to happen when I get that contract. Okay. So you have to look at what's happening right now and maybe happening when we, we awarded this contract, it's gonna be a cost for us, okay? So you're gonna rethink all of these elements that we're talking about today. Again, telephone, payroll taxes, and miscellaneous. Um, 
You have to look at the things, uh, other things you do internally that indirectly affect that contract performance. That's why we call this section indirect rates, okay? The only thing that's direct is the cost of the labor that you're providing. That's why we start with direct labor. Anybody have questions? Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Are you able to provide a sample template to calculate all the expenses? Exactly, that's one of the uh, handouts that uh, I will provide Yasmin to send to you with the copy of the PowerPoint, okay? Okay, uh, this one's from Tamika who asks, what should we expect to pay if we hire a consultant to develop our cost proposal? The cost varies, and I mean, uh, I know, you know, it's no one rate and depends on the person and their expertise and how, you know, really how large the proposal is. You know, I price proposals where there are hundreds of labor categories, okay? So my rate will vary based on, I really kind of base it on the labor categories I'm, I'm, I'm pricing for and what the government requirements are as far as the um, volumes and whether it's a lot of detail that they want and, and to provide in that response. So I, I can't definitively say that what the right would be, would be, but it depends on the individual that you engage. Um, it's best to get a quote and you know see if it fits within your, your budget and hopefully that individual that you uh, want to engage will, will definitely explain why their rate it, it, it will cover you know anything that needs to be done during that period of the development of that particular cost proposal okay okay one last one uh what is the source of oh percentage calculation overhead i'm, oh, thinking, H, I'm right? thinking that's an abbreviation for overhead yeah well then what you say the question again the, so what is the source of overhead percentage calculation? What is the source? Okay, that's what we, we just went back, went back over, went over previously under overhead, all of those elements. So those, everything that I listed under overhead, and you can even, like I was mentioning that uh, in some companies, they include fringe under the overhead, which Really, technically, French is an overhead, but for purposes of the class, instead of putting so many elements, we kind of break it out into two sections, and we do French plus overhead and build our rate that way, okay? Because under overhead, it's not just the direct cost for that person, it's other things that from the corporate office that you would put in there that affect that contract directly, okay? So all of the direct costs are under overhead, okay? Um, and when you get to the GNA, that's more of a, to me, a true indirect cost, okay? But, you know, they call overhead and GNA both indirect costs, but one, the overhead are more specific to the contract, I'll put it that way, than the over GNA cost. I hope that answers your question. Okay, yes. Uh, one last one. Uh, where or how do you obtain the cost information for the fringe benefits? That's from your company. It depends on if you're new and you, and you have to look at and you're doing your first proposal, then you need to decide what am I going to give my employees when I hire them, okay? So there may be you projecting and estimating the cost of things, so you need to go and get quotes from different healthcare providers to see exactly what the cost of the plan would be if I were to win this contract and um, sign everybody up for benefits, okay? So you would also, that's why I say you need to talk, be close with your accountant and see exactly what you're currently doing or what you're projecting to do later. Okay. And I know if it's your first contract, it's a little 
kind of unclear what you're going to do right then, but you, you have to propose some things because you need to justify to the government that I'm going to be able to hire and retain these people. So you need to either think of some free things you can give people or at least give them access to some sources that will satisfy their needs and keep them there to grow with your company. Okay. So as you grow, you're going to get better and better in, uh, benefits. You may even grow to the point where you buy 401k. It's up to the individual company to decide what those things are. So fringe benefits are both mostly what you provide the company. But the set things are like the FICA and the FUDA. These are like state mandates and federal mandates on percentages of cost that you need to uh, pay the government. You know, uh, like for instance, on FICA, the employee pays a, an amount of FICA, but the company matches that amount, right? In your particular paychecks today, that's what happens if you're working for an organization in federal contracting or even commercially, okay? You have to match the FICA. So that's a percentage that would always be there, okay? Hope that answered the question. Okay, yeah, we have another question. Okay. Is there a website where we can identify all fringe costs associated in a particular state? Yes, it is. All you have to do is search the state and current, and I would say current um, FICA rates, current suitor, current suitor rates, okay? Um, the only thing that might not be there will be like, um, you know, workman's comp, because that's a policy that you would buy. So you have to look at your particular cost, your particular workman's comp policies and stuff like that, okay? But definitely use Google. <laughs> That's what I say, I like Google everything. Okay. okay, there's another part to the question. Um, he says, he heard that there are companies like Zenefit who take care of all of this, as in they deal with all the HR work and costs. Have you heard of that? Yes, I or have. Or what do you think about them rather? I mean, it depends on what the state of your company and where you are, and if there's something that you can afford, okay? And depending on the size, you know, if you have a lot of employees, then that cost is not going to be a cheap cost, okay? So you have to weigh the difference and, and how it benefits you. If you just don't want the headache and you want, you know, want to really have somebody else accountable for the quality that that service provides to your employees, then you may decide to go with the company like that rather than managing the individual functions within your company, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, I would do uh, a good job in trying to vet which company to go with, you know. Um, there are a variety of ones out here. Um, you may just wanna go ahead and get uh, an HR person and an experienced one who's able to hire I mean, uh, cover all of the areas that you need to support for your your company at that point. But as you grow, you know, you reinvent your company many times, okay? So, you know, you, you may change or decide this is what I'll do for a while. And then as the company grows and you get the resources to bring that in-house, you may decide to do that. But, I, you know, it's, up, it's a business decision that you need to think as you to to consider what when you're planning your future for your company and where you currently are okay that's all the questions for now okay so now we're going to come up with um that calculation including the gna so the formula is labor pool plus french pool plus overhead pool Divided by the GNA base. It's going to give you your GNA percentage. Okay. Now, the spreadsheet that I'm going to provide uh, Yasmin to send to you guys is going to have um, these formulas there for you to look at and you can play with it and, and put numbers in and kind of see what it looks like, you know, different scenarios if you want. So it's pretty much a, an active spreadsheet and uh, you can take to your advantage and use it when you're developing your, your um, spreadsheets. 
you know, they have to keep in mind that the government will sometimes provide their own spreadsheets for you. Sometimes they have their formulas already embedded. Um, so when you get those spreadsheets in your solicitation package, make sure you check those out. And I have to admit that was a lesson learned for me. Um, you know, you just assume that when the government sends you something, oh, it's perfect. Well, that's not true. Um, sometimes, even in this, the uh, transmission of this spreadsheet can make the call the formulas mess up, and some of the sales may be not functioning right when you get it. And uh, <laughs> I have to recall a certain uh, time when we were working, and you know, I always do my calls on my spreadsheet, then I import it over to the government spreadsheet. And then we realized that all of the formulas were going crazy and everything was messed up. Um, so it was the 11th hour. So, you know, we had to go in and try to correct the government spreadsheet. But, you know, you have to consider that government is using a different computer, maybe a different soft, you know, software to develop theirs and you're trying to import things over. So it's good to try that spreadsheet out early on when you first get the solicitation because, um, since then, I've noticed, you know, a lot of people will call that to the attention of the government and they have to redo the whole spreadsheet. OK, and and they might even submit two or three iterations of that spreadsheet before the proposal is submitted. So when you're doing your review of things and question and answer period, check out the spreadsheets. Should the government make that a requirement to use their provided spreadsheet so that you know that it's all the formulas are working correctly and everything's good when you get ready to submit your proposal. Just a little tip bit there. Okay, last but not least, but the most important, because this is the reason you're in business, right? To get your fee and profit, right? And that's what I say. Um, your fee is based on the company's discretion. But you must consider how competitive your price will be when deciding on the percent of fee to charge the government. Now, again, you also can look at the risk that you're going to take, okay, uh, as a company in performing that contract. So you might want to go lower if you have a low, a low risk contract versus one where the risk is really great, and uh, in order to to really have a little bit of cushion there to fall back on if some things happen that you didn't really consider okay so you might want to include that in your fee and you a lot of times people start out with budgeted that base their whole proposal on budgeting and a lot of times you are making assumptions because if you're bidding on a contract that's going to be awarded three months in uh, later then you don't know what might change. So, you know, you might want to go with a, a nice fee that will cover some unknowns should they occur and you still make a profit. You see what I'm saying? Um, at worst case, you know, you don't want to go below breaking even, right? Because that means you're losing money. So, again, it's a business decision, but it's something that you need to think through, you know. I've seen some companies get down to fee and then they decide to um, drop it a little bit just to be more competitive, you know, or to get to a point where they think it could be the winning bid. And, um, we have uh, what we call pricing analysis that we do and we come up with the price to win and we try to get our cost as close to that price to win as we can. And that depends on the intelligence you have about the bid. If you know what the current incumbent is, is uh, working at, what the total contract value is, then you might want to, you know, do that kind of analysis and kind of come up with, you really want to play with your fee or make sure that your indirects are not inflated too much, your other indirects like your French, GMA, and overhead, and, and do, do adjustments as necessary. But then again, it depends on, you know, if you have several contracts, you can kind of play with stuff sometimes because you may have more profit that you're making on other contracts that will cover if you, you know, 
run into the red on a certain atom. But if you're just one, two, three contracts or something like that, it's kind of risky to kind of play to that extent. So, you know, it should be well thought out and agreed upon in your organization by the powers to be. And um, you also have to justify it and then it's disclosed what those fees are in your cost spreadsheet and or in your cost volume where you actually write out how you developed your proposal. Okay, uh, here's just some examples of things that I've noticed um, with the companies that I've been working with over the years um, in the types of fees that they charge. Um, small companies usually be between seven to 10, while larger companies usually be at much lower fees like from two to six. And um, it's a reason for that. You know, the smaller companies, especially ones that set aside, you know, um, they they understand when you're smaller, your indirect rates are usually much higher because your revenue is a lot lower. Okay. As you get more contracts, for instance, like especially GNA, your GNA goes down. In small companies, your GNA is going to be really high. Because you don't have the contract base to spread cost across all contracts. Okay. So as you as you gain more contracts, your GNA rate becomes a little more competitive each time. Um, a lot of companies try to do a GNA, I mean the ideal, you know, for uh, getting a GNA rate is a single digit, you know. But as a small business initially starting out with all the, let's say you have a full staff at your office supporting one contract or two contracts, your GNA is going to be higher. But you'll see as you grow your company, you'll, you'll become more competitive because your GNA rate is going to go down. All right. So these are some examples um, of fees to consider. Um, and if you're doing in manufacturing, or like I say, you're really doing some high risk contract, then you know, hey, I've seen them up to 12% to 15%. <coughs> Excuse me. So do just don't just slap the fee on top of the, all the costs and keep going. It's something you need to seriously consider and make it a business decision. Any questions? Yes, we do. Um, this question is, my company's indirect rates are very high. If we use these rates for an RFP, my company's winning uh, a new contract chain. Oh, I think it, he, he means my company's chance of winning a new contract is low. What should we do in this case? Well, what you do, what we do is we recommend is if the company is running a certain way, then you can also look at what the just segregate this contract out from the rest of the company, right? And look at what it's going to take to perform this specific contract. We call we call and when I what I've just described to you, this build up is what we call building from the bottom up. Okay. So let's say I'm gonna give you use this example, which may help you better. If you let's say your company has a GSA contract and in GSA, what you are awarded are ceiling rates, right? And so you have the maximum rates that you could charge any government agency who buys into the, the GSA contract. So when you go to bid on a task order, using that rate wouldn't be competitive for you because it's based on a much higher indirect rates, okay? What you need to find out is what exactly is going to take me to bid this particular contract and come up with the actuals for each. Okay. And then bid those because it's going to be, it should lower, okay, based on running that one particular contract and just segregating all those costs into that area. Some companies even develop what we call cost centers. If you're, if you're doing different um, different types of work, like you might have DOD work that you're doing, and uh, let's say you have, you have a lot of 
cost plus work under there, whatever, or even firm fixed price or time and materials. You can you can pull all of that together to kind of get specific indirect rates for each cost center that you develop in your company. But you just have to be able to document it and justify it each of those. So when you build it from the bottom up, and you're only looking at the cost of that, then you would use the rates that come out of that that should be much lower than the astronomical rates that you say you have already. Okay, so just take another look at the cost elements that are being applied in the overall company rates versus what it would cost us to do that particular uh, contract. And that, that should help ease that pain and make you more competitive, okay? So, and, and you need to do that in order to justify decreasing those rates in order to bid on specific bids. I'll put it that way, okay? Okay, thanks. The next question is, do these fees change because we are acting as a subcontractor? Um, no, because it's going to, when you're bidding as a subcontractor, you come up with your rates the same way, okay? Based on the cost for the number of labor categories that you're being subcontracted or products or services, whatever, however, you know, whatever you're bidding for. So you're you're just bidding on the portion of the work that is being subcontracted and what the current state of your company is, where you are, okay? So normally, in a prime sub relationship, the prime will provide the sub with what we call target rates. Because in order for you to work with that prime contractor, you have to, your rate to them has to fit within their rate to the government. Okay. Let's say if their rate is $100 and the government's agreed on that $100, they may come and say, okay, sub, I will hire you, but your rate is $80. Yes, your ceiling. So you need to do the same process. Build that rate from the bottom up to see if $80 will cover all your costs and give you some profit with performing as a subcontractor under that uh, contract. Okay. So the same process is good for subs that the prime would use as well. So that's how you build your rates in general. So you know where you are. So you know how to negotiate with your prime contractor when they offer you a, a target rate, whether you can live with it or not, okay? So I always recommend building up from the bottom. You know, I've seen companies, especially new companies, you know, they really don't have an idea and they don't take time to even kind of guesstimate what would happen should they win and how your company financials will fall out. So they'll go and look at other companies on the GSA schedule, for instance, or one of the other IDIQ contracts and say, oh, they're charging this for that position, so I'll charge that. And you're, you're at a disadvantage because, again, you don't know what the elements of that particular rate includes for that company, and you're just giving a rate that they have on another contract, and you're like, you might be performing and you might lose money, okay? So it's always good to know or get a good idea of what you're, you're bidding and if it really will cover the cost that you're, you're, you're uh, expending for operating that particular contract or subcontract. Anything okay, Aline, we, yeah, we just have one more question. Um, can Career Builder and GSA sources act as good sources for labor hour determination for state and local contracts? For state and local? Um, you know what? I would definitely ask the question, okay? Um, again, you would build it up like the, like, like I guess it's I just discussed and make sure that um, the state knows that's the source that you're using, okay? 
um, and that the projects are comparable. Okay, so you're gonna have to know, you know, what what of what is required for this. If there there if it's oranges and oranges, then uh, yes. And just be be careful when you're using GSA rates. When you look online and see a GSA rate or your GSA rate that you're you're awarded, and you're trying to use that for the state, that that's the ceiling, because whenever you use the GSA rates and you're bidding on any task orders under that contract, you're going to have to discount that to the gov for the government, right? So you're really not using that ceiling rate all the time. I mean, you have to really justify using the ceiling rate most of the time. But in order to be competitive and play with everybody else under that GSA contract a task order, you're going to have to take that maximum rate that you have under your schedule and see and compare it to the, the actual cost to perform and then discount accordingly. Okay. So I hope I can, under, you know, you can understand that. Um, if not, you know, you know, you can contact Yasmin and, and she can contact me and maybe we can get a private session where, you know, I can kind of help explain some things to you guys, you know, but, you know, that can be arranged, Yasmin, if anybody requests that. Okay, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay, anybody, now we'll keep going. because It's almost 1130, so we need to keep going. Other direct costs, ODCs. These are other costs that will directly affect the performance of the contract. Costs that, which are identified specifically with a particular project or contract are called other direct costs. Thus, direct materials are, are those goods or services which are purchased for the for and used directly on a specific project. Um, being a subcontractor, somebody mentioned being a subcontractor, okay. You are another direct cost to the prime contractor, okay, as a subcontractor, right? Okay. Travel, that's an ODC. Sometimes equipment and supplies is included in this area, okay? And normally if you were asked to provide equipment or supplies for a contract, um, the equipment would be, you know, the cost for all those things would be reimbursed to you on a monthly basis or as incurred. And uh, at the end of the contract, you have to keep in mind that those, that equipment would be the property of the government and you return that to the government. Supplies are usually, you know, you know dispensable, you know, you, you can't, it's not like a property item that's going to be left. If you buy pencils every month, then you just get reimbursed for whatever you use during the contract performance. Um, but um, these are typically it. The contract solicitation will, will tell you any ODCs that they're going to uh, reimburse for. And, and sometimes, like for instance, travel, um, they might ask you to estimate the number of the amount of travel that the employees assigned under that contract will be utilizing and provide an estimate and the government will like incrementally fund that as travel is needed throughout the, the contract performance okay um sometimes the government will allow you to um include their od your other direct costs of uh of gna fee on top of it because in actuality, um, it managing those things for the government is going to incur additional costs for you, the contractor, because your accounting department is going to have to go back and um, do the cost estimates, make sure that the bills are the uh, travel costs are billed correctly, uh, create the invoices. All of that is additional cost to you for managing that travel for those employees. So. The GNA fee percentage added on to that, it's sometimes allowed by the government, but they will tell you directly in the bid if they will allow you to add um, what we call like, sort of like a handling fee on top of these types of ODCs. So keep that in mind. We definitely do uh, include a subcontractor handling fee because, again, 
you're going to be uh, receiving invoices from your subcontractors, reviewing them, and also your accounting department has to receive the invoices, check them, and make payment. So it's up to you to decide what percentage of your GNA you're going to apply to these other direct costs. Okay, but they are allowable if they are justified. Okay. It's just the rules of travel costs. Um, you need to abide by the um, the GSA and federal travel regulations, and um, that should be a part of your accounting policies once you start doing business with the government. And um, travel is a part of the contracts that you are working on. Okay, so you'll be billing that on a monthly basis but pay attention to those regulations and then make sure that you stay abreast of any changes that may come up you know during the performance of the contract that may affect travel costs material and handling fee see this is what i was talking about earlier about a portion of gna percentage can be applied to your odc costs okay so it could be we call it several things, but part of it, if you have any equipment and stuff like that, and it supplies material and handling fee. And um, this is a part of your GNA costs for handling, you know, those supplies or travel, managing the travel service and or managing your subcontractor. Okay. Again, you just need to make sure that you defend your cost proposal to the government in the narrative that you provide in the cost file. And these things should be covered as well. Let's talk about allowable and unallowable costs for the government. Now, especially when you get to the point where you're uh, going to be audited, um, small businesses currently aren't really held to the uh, contract acquisition uh, standards. But I suggest that when you start doing business with the government, that you start doing it right from the beginning, that you align your company with the, all of the requirements that the government's gonna have you perform as your company grows. So that when you get to that revenue size where these things are a requirement, you're doing them right anyway. And now I noticed the government, even for small business proposals, they want to know what kind of accounting system you have. Uh, how are you allocating costs? How are you uh, segregating costs and tracking your job costs specifically? Even though you're a small company, because it's crucial that you know exactly what the cost of each contract is. And if, I know most of you probably have worked in the private sector where you are on government contracts and or state, local, whatever. And if you notice, most organizations give you um, a job code, okay, on your timesheets or, you know, whatever time keeping system they may have, there are, each labor category has a job code that it, um, tracks the contract you're working on and the position you're working in which is tied to a specific billable rate. So they can quickly get a printout showing, you know, how much it costs to employ that individual and all, with all their benefits and everything on each contract. So you might've heard the term job cost. That's big when it comes to really kind of breaking down what um, incurred costs we have and then segregating what's allowable and what's not, okay? Um, there's a, a list of things that the government can deem not allowable on certain contracts, okay? And you need to be aware of those things. Um, I referenced the subpart of the FAR regulations, which is the Federal Acquisition Regulations, um, when it discussed contracts with commercial organizations, which are private firms. So it kind of shows you things that in that FAR regulation that are acceptable and what are not. So please get familiar with that. Uh, refer to it as often. Uh, 
the FAR is good. And in any solicitation that the government releases, you're going to see a list of contract clauses. Okay. Um, and in that, you're going to show applicable state and or local regulations, okay, that are under the FAR that you can actually look up and see how that applies to the bid that you're preparing and then how that's going to flow down to the contract that you may be awarded, okay. Um, I mentioned being a contract administrator, and, and I still am for several companies in the area. Um, that's part of my function is to make sure that they're complying with all of the contract clauses that are there. And a lot of, you know, the FAR is really boring. It's like looking a bit, reading a big law manual, okay? Um, but, it, you know, after a while and you're bidding on contracts regularly, you're going to see certain contract clauses come up on all, all of the different that are similar and you'll get used to them and kind of know what they are and what that means. So, you know, you need to um, have someone who was willing to research and learn it or connect with the contract administrator who can help you navigate that. Um, and most companies grow into that once they get the revenue to bring on a contract administrator uh, part time to full time as they grow. But definitely when you get to mid <clears throat> a mid-sized company, you really need to uh, have a full-time contracts person to kind of make sure you stay in compliance with all of the uh, federal acquisition regulations that apply to your contract. And as you uh, bring on subs, subcontractors, you know, if you're the prime contractor, all of the terms and conditions in the fires are kind of like passed down or filtered down to the subcontract that you're going to enter into with your subs. So keep that in mind, um, that you all plan by the same rules for each contract that you um, go, go in together. And please keep in mind that all solicitations are a little different. They might be for the same agency, similar work, but you have to make sure you can't assume that they all, oh, I'm doing the same work, pretty much the same thing. No, you need to specifically look and make sure that you're making sure that you're following the rules for that specific contract you have been awarded. Any questions there? No. Uh, just people asking me if this webinar is being recorded. Yes, it is. And I will be sharing it on our website later this afternoon. I'll send you all the link. Um, Martin says, how does a cost proposal look different when we are proposing to be a sub to a prime? It depends on what the government has requested. Um, on a lot of the DOD ones, it's, uh, contracts or proposals that you were bidding on. Um, for instance, let's say you're an established company and you have, you know, uh, your own accounting system and, you know, you're teaming with the company as the, as a sub, the, the government will ask to see what your indirect rates are, right? So the government will require all bidding subcontractors to submit a separate cost proposal, okay? In addition, you have to agree on rates with this prime before you submit, of course, but you need to justify the rates that you submit to the, the prime as a part of your contract to the government. So you would actually submit a separately sealed package to the government per instructions of the RFP, because they're going to tell you how to do it. Uh, generally, it's not done through the prime because you don't, that's your proprietary information as a subcontractor, what your indirects are. The only thing you're providing the, the prime contractor are the rates that you agreed upon, okay? So that's the difference in bidding as a sub and a prime under a government contract. Um, uh, if it's not that DOD or some of these civilian company uh, or the government comp organizations, I'm sorry, will uh, not even ask for the sub rates but they're just X, you know, all they're concerned about is the bill rate for the government from the prime. And so the negotiation 
for the rapes and stuff is just between you and the crime. And you would be given the, the target rates and you just agree to those rates or not. Okay. Or you could pick, well, I can live with this for for the positions. And so that's all I'm going to sell for you, you know, stuff like that. Um, but as far as, you know, giving full justification, that can be requested by the government. So be advised. Um, but generally, it's just a negotiation between you and the prime contractor. The reasoning being, too, is that, you you know, it, although you are teaming with the prime contractor today, tomorrow you guys could become competitors. And you don't want to give away all of your indirect rate information. That's your proprietary information. So, you know, please do not share that, you know. Um, and, you know, just stick to the particular contract you're working on and make sure that you're covering all the costs the same way the prime is covering all their calls to the government. Okay. Let's see. Just going to talk a little bit about an adequate accounting system. Those of you who have not reached that stage, um, you know, I can talk about the importance of keeping up with your job costs. Okay, um, and as you get larger, larger firms, if you reach a certain size standard, you're going to have to um, do certain reports to the government. You know, um, and uh, they have to agree on your your approved indirect rates annually. And that's usually done through defense contract audit agency. And, you know, like I'm, I'm saying to the small businesses that, you know, it's good to know this in advance and be prepared to be responsive to those things later. But if you set up your accounting system now properly, then you'll be already doing what the government will require you to do as you grow. Um, some of the best accounting systems out there is, uh, you know, Dell Tech. Uh, there's another one. But the actuality for the smaller companies, you know, if, if you want to go ahead and get start doing it the right way, you need you can even do it with QuickBooks now. And um, I've been told that BCAA has approved that as uh, providing good information for accounting, you know, tracking your cost and um, charging, you know, the right expenses under the right contracts and stuff like that, so that you are already being compliance when you get to that, that point. Large companies are already doing it, people doing business with the, with the government, and they have to get their rates approved on an annual basis. So, you know, as the solicitations come out, you'll see, you know, them request specific information on your accounting system. They want to know what system you're using for timekeeping. Um, actually, you know, sometimes there's a whole response in the business cost proposal that you have to uh, talk about to describe how you're keeping um, or segregating your costs. All right. So I mentioned uh, the chart of account that says the minimum components are a chart of accounts, a timekeeping system, the specific codes for projects and indirect labor, a chart of accounts, and our appropriate journals and project cost summaries. And they're looking for it to be detailed. Um, sometimes companies will bid, and let's say they have last year's rates. And, you know, DCA gets backed up, and I'm, I'm told that, you know, a lot of times, they don't get your rates approved for the current year. So what companies do is do, they, they look at where they were, let's say in 2020, and now it's 21. So they would do a budgeted, okay, a summary, a budget, and of their what their rates would look like for 2021. And when you're doing your cost proposals that way, and, you, and, that, and that's because you haven't gotten approved accounting indirect rates for that year, you would actually let the government know this cost proposal is based on our budgeted indirect rates for year 2021. Okay. So there are ways to stay in compliant, but I'm, I'm saying the key is to justify everything 
be able to defend your cost proposal adequately. Um, so don't just put stuff in there because, you know, even if they're not going to audit you, they can come back and ask questions and you need to be able to provide the answer to it. And sometimes they, if they ask for it in the RFP and you don't give it, that can be a big grounds to throw you out because you did not provide that information. We've even seen times the government will ask you for current financial statements, okay? If you don't provide those, that's grounds to throw you out. Just like I say for my technical proposal, you need a compliance matrix for your costs to make sure that you're giving them everything they're asking for in an RFP under Section L instructions, okay? Any questions here? Yes. Um, let's see. There was a couple of questions from Erica. I think it was when you're talking about the software systems. Mm -hmm. And she asks about, she says, Dell Tech's too expensive. What do you think about UNANET? Do you know UNANET? I've heard of it, but I've never used it. Okay. Um, it, I know that, you know, I mentioned the reason I mentioned uh, QuickBooks was because I know that's fairly affordable for a lot of small businesses. So I'm um, thinking UNANET might be a little more expensive than, than uh, QuickBooks, but um, QuickBooks. I think if it's comparable, I would look at how comparable it is to QuickBooks. And that's one of the most affordable QuickBooks is. So um, if Uninet is around the same caliber as QuickBooks, then I would say yes. So, you know, do your due diligence and research first, though, okay? Make sure that they do the job costing. As far as cost, I'm not sure. I do know Dell Tech is very expensive. There's another one called Peachtree that's <coughs> similarly very expensive. So you have to be uh, one of the big boys to afford it. So kind of, yeah, you're right. Uninet is good to look at. Um, Dell Tech has a um, module uh, cost point that's a little bit, little bit more affordable for some companies. But um, do your research first before you invest in any of those and see what you know, you can afford and if it does the job, hey, stick with it. Okay, the question from Joel who asked, do you have a sample of a well-developed budget proposal that incorporates all of these costs? Um, budget, you mean like a breakout of the indirects? I do have a spreadsheet that I can provide that shows it, that can help you uh, develop your in, indirect or get an idea of what you're operating at for that particular contract. Um, I can also provide that one. Um, it's uh, a spreadsheet where you kind of list out all of the the uh, fringes, the overhead costs, and GNA elements for that particular bid. And again, we have um formulas there that will help create the percentages for each and they give you an idea of where you're operating on that particular bid or, you know that you're going to be pursuing so you know it's an example you can use and you can modify for other things you like and i will provide that to the answer as well okay um one more question we proposed, in a couple of RFPs we proposed last year, we found the agency wants to begin work right after the award announcement. What do you suggest about workflow to pursue after submitting a proposal and waiting for the announcement? Um, at a minimum, you have to have the people who are key personnel available. And it depends on the type of contract you're bidding, if it's an incumbent. A lot of times upon the contract award, you get to um, the opportunity to offer right of first refusal to the incumbent staff. And so you may be taking on people who are currently operating that under that contract who qualify to work for your under your new contract, and they can just be rebadged and moved over. Um, the government does that frequently because, you know, it's a uh, makes the transition in less headachey because the learning curve is not there that you would have if you were bringing in all brand new people. So 
um, that's how most companies kind of look at it. They, I mean, you, I like to include in my proposals that the we will give the incumbent staff right of first refusal, okay, for the position, you know, uh, upon a contract award. However, sometimes the government can take a long time to award contracts, okay, it gets extended out, and you might have people that you've given um, key positions who were signing letters of intent to come aboard with you guys, and when the contracts are awarded, they found another job because they couldn't wait until the contract was awarded and they are no longer available. In those cases, I suggest that you keep recruiting for maybe two or three people deep who match the individual that you propose. And when I say match, I mean match. They have to have, they should be like clones of that person, okay? So that, you know, the government can't say that you gave them a higher caliber person in the original proposal and then try to switch them out with somebody with less qualifications. So you should definitely keep your recruitment process going to make sure that it, at a minimum, the key people are available to start. And will you have comparable people to present immediately upon the contract award to the government for approval, okay? All right. Other cost components or considerations, direct labor escalation. Now, on, you, on most contracts, there, most contracts contain more than one base period of performance. So you're gonna have option periods in your contract as it awards. So when you're doing your costing, you need to provide direct labor escalation on the rates that you submit in your proposal. So you're gonna have to decide how much I'm going to apply to the base rear rates for the first option or you know other option periods that are on the contract because it varies. So um, a good way to establish that is to um, look for the consumer price index, which is the uh, inflation rate that the United States is experiencing at the time, or you know what the job markets are doing, what people are, you know how they're increasing people's salaries across the board. Um, you can just kind of Google uh, consumer price index and look up your line of uh, service area and see what the rates are. Okay, like you can look up our two services, and it'll show you how much to the consumer price index is for that particular uh, service area when you bid your proposals. And I will project that. Um, you can also just do it to be competitive. You might want to um, just do a 2% or 2.8 or, you know, or you can just definitively just use the consumer price index. But it's up to you, again, a business decision. Um, I sometimes you know, encourage people to kind of look at the the, the, the flow of people over the, the course of a contract, for instance, um, and how profitable you are. Like, if, and most companies, if, if, if you look at your contract flow of people in and out, if the contract is nearing in, then a lot of people leave because they're not sure that you're gonna get the contract awarded again. So they jump ship, right? So you wouldn't want to give a person an increase in the fourth year of the contract. And most people tend to leave during that period. And you have to get new people in. And you could most likely hire people at a lesser rate. So a lot of times we won't give an escalation in the last year of the contract. We give it in the second and third. And then the fourth, they would remain the same. Okay. Or you could give some people a raise, some people not. However, you decide to strategize. Your, your bidding um, for that particular uh, contract and manage um, the increases over time. But um, you need to keep that in mind when you're bidding. And this is definitely an important uh, way to um, keep your price, adjust your pricing and be competitive. 
Again, we talked about discounts from um, contract vehicles, such as GSA schedules or other BPAs or ADI IQs, because you're going to be dealing with bidding a, a ceiling rate and then discounting on the cash flow level. So like I mentioned earlier, you need to learn to kind of look at each cash order that comes out and build up what the true um, cost is for each so that you can discount adequately. Okay, so now it's time for other questions if you guys have any. Uh, no, I think you've pretty much answered all of them as we went through. Um, I will, somebody's asking me about the handouts. Yes, I am going to email um, the presentation plus all the samples that you have in your pack cost proposal package, Arlene. Oh, okay. And there's also um, information there on, on uh, how to contact Arlene as well if you'd like to use her services. Um, so, yeah, pretty much that's it. So I'd like to thank you, Arlene, so much. Okay. Today, and I'd like to thank everybody for participating. We do appreciate it. Um, we hope to see you on a future webinar. This is being recorded, so I will put this on the... It's probably going to take about a couple of hours, but probably later later this afternoon, you'll see the, um, the videos on the website. So thanks, Arlene. Thanks, everybody, for participating today, and see you again soon. Thank you very much, Dave, for joining us.